Genocide Against American Indians, a brief overview for high school students. This video is made possible by the California Department of Education as part of the Content, Literacy, Inquiry, and Citizenship Project, which provides professional learning and resources to help educators and school administrators successfully implement California's history social science framework. This video was developed in partnership with the Sacramento County Office of Education and the Genocide Education Project. Please be aware that this video deals with a sensitive topic. Accounts of violence against groups and individuals will be discussed, and graphic images will be included. The intended audience for this video is high school students and their educators. Viewer discretion is advised. The most respectful and scholarly materials were consulted in the development of this video. This video is not intended to provide a complete account of genocide, but rather serve as a place to begin a larger conversation about the topic. Welcome to this brief overview of Genocide Against American Indians. I'm Frank Peasy from the Sacramento County Office of Education, and today I will share with you what genocide is and its impact on American Indians. You will also hear from an individual whose family was impacted by ongoing genocidal policies. Please note, this video was developed in consultation with the International Association of Genocide Scholars. In this video, the terms American Indians and indigenous peoples are used interchangeably and refer to the same group of people. A note about the photographs. Most historical photographs of American Indians were taken by white people. They often had a political or financial motive to take photos. Some wanted to capture what they believed was a dying race. Others wanted to create false stereotypes to make money selling souvenir photographs. Many photographs were taken to build support of federal Indian policies, not in the best interests of native peoples. When you think of the word genocide, what comes to mind? Often, people think of the Holocaust in World War II. While this is probably the most well-known example of genocide, it is far from the only one. And those before and after carry important lessons we can learn from. Genocide is truly and unfortunately a worldwide phenomenon. In fact, genocide has happened on every continent except Antarctica. The word genocide is made up of the Greek prefix genos, meaning race or tribe, and the Latin suffix side, meaning killing. Genocide is an internationally recognized crime. Acts of genocide are committed with the intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a national, ethnic, racial or religious group. The definition of genocide was created by Raphael Lemkin, a Polish Jewish lawyer who lost 49 relatives to the Holocaust and fought tirelessly to have the term adopted by the United Nations. As shown here, the Convention for the Prevention of Genocide was signed during a ceremony at the UN in 1948. There are five categories of genocide according to the United Nations. One, killing members of the group. Two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or part. Four, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. And five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. To sum it up, if there is intent to destroy a specific group of people using any of the ways listed, then a genocide has occurred. It's important to study the history of a region in order to fully understand complex events like genocide. The process towards genocide begins when a group in a society is targeted for being different and stripped of equal rights. This process often continues with efforts to separate the group from the rest of society, as happened in Nazi concentration camps in World War II. One concentration and extermination camp, Auschwitz, is pictured here, with its barbed wire fences and buildings. To get a better understanding of how the historic treatment of American Indians affects individuals, let's hear from someone who experiences it firsthand. McKaylee Steen, a member of the Cherokee Nation will share her experience. 
I think being a Native American student pursuing a degree in higher education at the undergraduate level and at the graduate level now has been really difficult a lot of times because of the erasure that Native people face all through media and academia and all of the places where you might look to find someone that looks like you, you often can't. Um, and so for me, I think that one of the hardest things has been having to justify or explain my identity and my presence. Um, the United States government has done so much to erase, you know, indigenous culture in the United States and erase our stories. And so it's almost like as a Native student, I can't just come in and tell my story. I have to come in and tell hundreds of years of stories about what led to me being here in the first place and the perseverance that led to that as well. And I think that a lot of times... In some ways, that puts Native students at a disadvantage because you're carrying around a lot of generational trauma and you're moving through a lot of that. So whether it's the name of a person on a building that you are having to attend a class in that maybe was committing horrible acts within your community or the curriculum itself, there are so many times where we're faced with barriers to our um, having to justify our existence here. Genocide against American Indians spans centuries. According to moderate estimates, 50 to 60 million people lived in the Americas when Christopher Columbus arrived in 1492. An estimated 8 to 10 million lived in what is now the United States. By 1900, only 20% of the indigenous population of the Americas remained. Pictured is a group of 11 mini koju, children and adults, in a teepee camp probably on or near the Pine Ridge Reservation following the massacre at Wounded Knee by a federal cavalry. The destruction of American Indian nations was partly achieved through exposure to diseases brought by European colonizers. Violence against indigenous populations, including the intentional spreading of disease, also contributed to the large death toll. In many cases, this violence was directed by colonial governments and settlers. This drawing depicts Aztecs in the 1600s who were suffering from smallpox, demonstrating that this method of genocide spanned current political borders across the Americas. The period from the mid-1700s to early 1800s marked a decline in relations between European colonists and indigenous populations. During the French and Indian War, France and the colonies of British America fought for control of land in America. Indigenous groups supported both sides during this time, as depicted in this image. Some groups supported Great Britain and others supported France, who relied more heavily on American Indian tribes during the war. These tribes experienced a more favorable relationship with the French. During the American Revolution, while some American Indian tribes supported the colonists, others supported Great Britain, fearful of what an independent American nation would bring to them. After the United States won independence, most indigenous peoples were considered traitors, regardless of who they supported. Now, let's discuss the victims and the perpetrators. The victims were the indigenous people, who made up hundreds of nations in what is now the United States. Not only did American Indians look and dress differently than the Europeans, but they also had different languages, customs, and religious practices. When European colonization in what is now the United States began, Settlers made distinctions between themselves and the indigenous inhabitants of the land, who they called Indians. Many European settlers were the perpetrators who believed that they were superior to indigenous people and often described people from Indian tribes as savages, barbarians, or wild animals. Many European colonists felt it was their divine mission to civilize indigenous people and bring them to a more European way of life. Over the years, government policy toward American Indians has shifted back and forth between one of assimilation to segregation. Before the 1820s, the U.S. government encouraged assimilation, pushing tribes to give up their cultural practices and integrate into white American society. Later, it created a policy of segregation, separating American Indians from the rest of the population, often physically removing indigenous peoples from their land. This policy led to numerous violent interactions between indigenous tribes and the U.S. government. Pictured is John Ross, who led the Cherokee Nation in fighting against the Indian removal policy. 
Even though Ross, a Cherokee, had assimilated in many ways to white society, he still could not save his people from the genocidal policies of President Andrew Jackson, which will be addressed later in this video. In the 1870s, the policy would again begin to shift back toward assimilation with the establishment of boarding schools for American Indians. Why did the U.S. government want to separate and remove Native peoples from the land? Throughout the 1800s, one of the reasons the U.S. government moved to separate and remove Native peoples was because the idea of the settled farmer, someone who was relatively stationary and owned, worked, and lived off the land, was central to America's new identity. As a result, the desire for land and westward expansion increased throughout the 19th century. Shown here is a Lakota teepee camp near Pine Ridge, South Dakota. The Lakota were one of many tribes that suffered greatly during the era of Western expansion. Another reason fueling genocidal acts against American Indians was the desire to build an American empire. According to government officials, American Indian inhabitants of the land were preventing the United States from meeting this desire. In 1872, artist John Gast painted Spirit of the Frontier. It depicts white people moving west. Above them is Columbia, the female representation of the U.S. in a toga to symbolize classical republicanism. She is shown bringing light to what whites perceived as a dark world. This is the era of Manifest Destiny, where many Americans felt it was their God-given right to expand the United States from coast to coast, regardless of who was already living there. In many cases, the U.S. government made treaties with tribes, but settlers who ignored them or initiated violence against American Indians faced no consequences from the government. This essentially encouraged settlers to use violence against the indigenous inhabitants and take the land by force. This also often led to reprisals by these groups that could escalate up to and including military intervention. Government officials armed militias and warned settler populations that if they did not kill the indigenous people first, the indigenous people would kill them. Shown here is a depiction of the Sand Creek Massacre, which took place in Colorado Territory in 1864. This drawing was made by the artist Howling Wolf, a member of the Cheyenne tribe who was eyewitness to the event. Hoping to survive, some tribes attempted to assimilate into white society, adopting new American customs and practices. The Cherokee was one tribe that attempted to assimilate by adopting European customs, such as wearing European clothing and practicing European ways of life, like John Ross, who we previously discussed. This photo shows a Cherokee man who was wearing traditional clothes and hairstyle on the left and European style on the right. Despite this, they still faced discriminatory laws. These laws included banning the Cherokee and other indigenous groups from testifying against whites, or publicly protesting their living conditions. In 1829, gold was discovered in Cherokee territory. The following year, Congress passed the Indian Removal Act. Under this act, U.S. President Andrew Jackson, pictured here, set up treaties with American Indian tribes that took tribal lands in the East in exchange for lands in the West. This process was voluntary at first, but when tribes refused to leave, including the Cherokee, the government began removing them by force. One devastating result of the Indian Removal Act came to be known as the Trail of Tears. In 1838, almost 16,000 Cherokees still remained on their land in the east. The government responded by sending 7,000 troops to their homes and forcing them to leave. They were not allowed time to gather any supplies or belongings, so they began the 800-mile trek west from Georgia toward what is now Oklahoma, with nothing but the clothes on their backs. This forced removal of the Cherokee and other tribes is often referred to as the Trail of Tears, represented in this painting, because of the extreme hardship and death experienced on the trail. The Trail of Tears resulted in eradicated American Indian communities in the southeastern United States. Approximately 46,000 American Indians were forced from their homelands in this way, and close to 4,000 Cherokees died, primarily from exposure, disease, or starvation while on the forced march. More than 6,000 American Indians from other tribes also died on forced westward marches. The Trail of Tears is one example of genocide, but there were many other genocidal policies and actions started against indigenous populations of the United States. 
Genocidal acts against American Indians have occurred for centuries and continue today. Major moments in history marking these acts include 1. Treatment of American Indians under the mission system in California and the American Southwest, where the objective was not only to expand the Spanish Empire, but to also wipe out indigenous culture. This photograph is of the oldest mission in California, circa 1900. Mission San Diego Alcala was established in 1769. 2. The use of forced removal of American Indians during the Jacksonian era, which led to the Trail of Tears. 3. Violence against American Indians during the Civil War and post-Civil War era. These so-called Indian Wars in the Southwest and the Great Plains resulted in the massacre of thousands of American Indians. 4. The establishment of compulsory boarding schools from 1870s to 1960s. One example is the Carlisle Boarding School pictured here, which was founded by U.S. Army officer Richard Henry Pratt in 1879. It became a model for others established by the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA. American Indian youth were forced to attend these boarding schools. They were not allowed to speak their native language or wear their customary clothing. Boys were forced to have their hair cut. The goal was to destroy the children's connection with the American Indian traditions from the tribes and nations. Pratt said in a speech in 1892, A great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one. In a sense, I agree with the sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there in the race should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. 5. The 1950s termination period, when Congress adopted policies aimed at terminating federal obligations to tribes. If American Indians relocated to cities, the federal government believed they would have no obligation to provide additional support to them. This flyer is an example of the propaganda used to entice American Indians to relocate off of reservation land and into cities. The flyer reads, Chicagoland Indians get good jobs. Jobs recently obtained offer opportunity and security. In reality, the jobs available to American Indians were often low-paying and dangerous. While genocidal acts against American Indians occurred in every state in the Union, one extreme example can be seen in California during the gold rush. Peter Burnett, California's first governor, said in his second State of the State address, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result, but with painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the race is beyond the power or wisdom of man to avert. Burnett established the 1850 Act for the Government and Protection of Indians, which facilitated removing California Indians from their traditional lands, separating at least a generation of children and adults from their families, languages, and cultures. Many of these children were separated for the purpose of assimilating them into Western society. Setting aside state money to arm local militias against California Indians, and with the help of the U.S. Army, Burnett distributed weapons to militias who were tasked with raiding tribal outposts and scalping and killing indigenous people. According to the historian Benjamin Madley, about 100,000 indigenous people in California died as a result of violence during the first two years of the gold rush alone. At least 16,000 murders of native Indians of California are documented during this time. By 1873, only 30,000 indigenous people remained in California. Let's return to McKaylee Steen to learn about how she is working to overcome the devastation of the past and current treatment to survive and maintain her tribal traditions today. There's definitely a feeling of pride and pain simultaneously. There's pride in knowing how much we've survived and that that strength exists in me too. And there's also the pain of knowing everything that we've lost and wondering what could have been or um, what I might know or be doing differently in my life had certain things been able to persist throughout our family. I take my responsibility to stay connected and to reconnect with my culture very seriously. After the Trail of Tears and that period of removal of tribes from the southeastern United States, there was also a period of sending 
Native American children to boarding schools. And so there's this ongoing, like, taking children from their families. And the the phrase that was associated with boarding schools was kill the Indian, save the man. And that's also a part of this cultural genocide of, you know, saving the parts that are white enough or um, that are, you know, not Indian or not Native American and saving the parts that were, you know, useful to a colonial society. And so my family members distanced themselves from the culture and from the tribe in an effort to not only prevent something like removal from happening again, but also to continue to protect themselves like thing, from things such as the, the boarding school era. And so I am now in a unique position of privilege, as I view it, to be safe. I am safe. I am not persecuted or forced from my home town because I'm Native American. And so I am I am in a position of privilege to be able to pursue cultural knowledge. And I'm working on learning my language. And I want to be able to pass down to my kids all of the things that I wasn't able to have as a, as a child in terms of that oral history and oral tradition and wearing regalia and things like that. I, I take that very seriously. It is important to note that even today, colonialism and colonialist policies still exist, and indigenous tribes and people are largely treated as second-class citizens. What is the aftermath of these genocidal policies? Here are just a few examples. California Governor Gavin Newsom acknowledged the genocide against American Indians in 2019 and apologized. As of 2021, the U.S. government still denies the genocide of American Indians. As a result, the history of indigenous genocide has been left out of history textbooks and federally funded museums, including the Museum of the American Indian. The effects of the genocide are ongoing after centuries of persecution. Because of historical revision and other forms of discrimination, many American Indians today still suffer from the effects of the genocide and centuries of persecution. Colonialism and colonialist policies still exist today, leaving American Indians in often difficult situations and with few resources. Indigenous tribes and people are largely treated as second-class citizens. This treatment can be seen in many different ways, from health issues to extreme poverty to threats to the survival of many American Indian tribes. Genocide still plagues societies around the globe today. After learning about this genocide, consider the following questions. What are the short and long-term consequences for individuals and groups who do not have equal rights under the government of their country of residence? What is the responsibility of countries to intercede in stopping mass violence in other areas of the world? What is the responsibility of individuals to intervene on behalf of people facing danger within and outside of their own countries? While this was a brief account of a very complex set of circumstances in history, it's important to understand that the unjust use of power and the use of violence to achieve one's goals should never be tolerated. As individuals, we have an obligation to call out injustice when we see it. As a group, we have the responsibility to do all we can to ensure that genocides like the one presented here never happen again. Thank you to the Genocide Education Project for their content expertise and to the International Association of Genocide Scholars and the Collaboration Committee of the Content, Literacy, Inquiry, and Citizenship Project for their support in the development of this video. Technical production of this video was performed by the Sacramento County Office of Education's Internet and Media Services Department.